Okay, so with a single currency area, they like to see synchronized business cycles. Conventional monetary policy is a little bit different. Um, and so that, that's kind of the main reason. All right, what was number two? Okay, so labor flows. Why is that one important? Yeah, kind of any, any resources we'd like to move freely through the zone. So truly the free trade zone is kind of the start to that, that we can move goods and services without any tariffs, right? But even now, we have immigration rules that keep especially Mexican workers from coming across. Uh, I just learned here recently, um, Americans cannot own land in Mexico. Uh, my wife went on a, a mission trip and they were building a house for this thing and um, uh, they met as part of the people that own some property there. They found a little loophole in the law that they formed a corporation, a group of people who wanted to buy land and then they were able to kind of buy it as a corporation, as an American corporation. But um, technically, US citizens can't own land there. So we got these uh, interesting restrictions on resources between the two. And if we don't allow labor, if the US is up and Mexico is down, and we don't allow the labor to flow to where the times are good so that we can achieve some sort of equilibrium across uh, the countries, um, that, that can cause some problems um, of one country again being uh, stuck with uh, a bad situation while the other country prospers and then there's no correction mechanism because the correction mechanism would be that resources would be attractive to the place that's prospering. And so if we restrict that, then we might be kind of in a rut where we're stuck with um, a situation that's not good for a period of time until something else busts. Okay. Uh, what was the third thing here? I think there was one more, wasn't there? What's that? Regional policies, okay. So the regional policies, these could be fiscal type policies too. So um, right now, again, kind of remember back to, to macro class principles, um, the government can lower taxes, which is an expansionary fiscal policy. And that's supposed to be to stimulate the economy could be inflationary, will be inflationary in the long run if it's not accompanied by some other things. But the Federal Reserve could apply a contractionary money supply, a contraction to the money supply at the same time. So that can offset what that fiscal policy is doing. And so if we start to tie up a few things here, we could get into situations where either the Mexican government or the US government is doing fiscal policies that are competing with each other. So some sort of agreements on what you can and can't do um, is also all part of this uh, process of starting to get synchronized business cycles as well. Okay? So not quite as easy as it, as it looks, um, <clears throat> but those folks who fall into the let's fix the money supply to the gold standard or let's have a fixed policy of some sort for monetary policy, this wouldn't be as big of a deal. 
we'd be handcuffing the, uh, the Mexican government, uh, monetary authorities, as well as the Americans, and it might lead to some beneficial things. But um, try to take power away from some organizations or constituents of government is like trying to take a bone away from a dog. Right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go without a fight typically. Um, uh, if we move towards that kind of kind of change, take it away. All right, questions or comments there? All right, so that wraps up chapter 10, kind of our last little tidbit there. Um, we're going to spend uh, really the rest of the semester focusing in on uh, oh, some, some specific areas and topics. So one of those is going to be your, um, your project. Um, and, and the other is going to be some other exercises on some other countries. So I think what I'm going to do is, is get a introduction into chapter 12 for starters. And we will probably even cut out a little early after I turn you loose on another uh, special project. So chapter 11 we're skipping, which is macro, <coughs> by the way. The kind of little tidbits we were just doing. It would be another aggregate demand, aggregate supply. Um, and for this class, uh, I didn't want to spend our time doing that to keep it more, more with current events here towards the tail end of the chapter. Um, chapter 12, however, before we get into those last sections, um, is on crises. Uh, let's see. I'm All right, so let me do. So we're going to apply some of the things that we've done in the in the previous chapters on in the exchange rates and on on the balance sheets and on why countries find themselves in. in <coughs> So, uh, I can't remember if this was introduced in the previous chapter or not. Contagion effects? What, what was that? What does it sound like? Related to disease. <laughs> when you get a cold and you're contagious, what does that mean? Okay, so that's what we got going on here. So, there was an old saying in international markets, which I think is still at least somewhat true today, when the United States sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. And because we were the main player in the international arena for a long time as a, as a solo country, less so once the EU kind of formed together and they're somewhat operating together, but it, it's still, still kind of true today. And so, <coughs> um, over time, we've seen areas where one country does something bad, uh, maybe has some uh, hyperinflation or something, and then it starts to affect their neighboring countries or trading partners through changes in the exchange rates. If you're a major importer of that country's goods or, or an exporter to that country, as the world becomes more global, then we're all more interconnected. And so in general, uh, we refer to that as these contagion effects. Questions there at all? Concept? So financial crises come down to banking crises. So you can kind of hone it right into, into that. Um, at the domestic level, 
we've talked in Money Banking class about the run on the bank, and the bank doesn't have all of your money. Since they are in the business of loaning out funds, if all the depositors come at one time, then you've got, uh, you've got some problems in funding all of that. So what was the answer to that domestically for the United States, where banks failed a lot in the 1800s and uh, even late 1700s? What was the answer to that crisis in the United States? The Federal Reserve. So that was the answer they came up with was to have a lender of last resort so that if a bank was in trouble, all the other banks would kind of pool their funds together, and if they needed a short-term loan, then they could go to the Federal Reserve to um, make good on those loans. And, and uh, it was really a, a timing question a lot of times, and that's the same way it works at, the, at this international level, um, is banks take on deposits, which are short-term obligations, since that that person can come in their door any day and withdraw their money, right? It's kind of a short-term relationship. But at the same time, the bank is engaging in long-term contracts, making home loans, car loans, other sorts of loans, so that there's a timing issue. If too many people come, I can't just immediately call my loans in and say, hey, sorry, I told you we'd do that loan for five years, but I need it today, and call the loan in. Um, so, that is, that's the, the setup for these timing issues that we'll see how that, that works in the, uh, around the world. All right, disintermediation. Banks becoming unable to serve as intermediaries between savers and investors. That's a little bit about what um, I just mentioned with the savers having short-term obligations, investors being long-term, and exchange rates falling, or we'll explore um, sudden changes in the exchange rate that can be due to panics or crisis. Can you explain to me how this type of crisis is similar for some families from personal finance? Try to kind of tie those, those things together about a crisis in your family. How does that work? Because they're, they're very similar in a lot of ways. Usually you either payday loans or credit cards to pay it off. Okay, so robbing Peter to pay Paul with loan to loan, is that what you're thinking? Might be one thing, yes. Okay, so using debt to pay off other debt. Are you really getting out of debt? No, you're just shuffling around paper. So you might be kicking the can down the road. And so countries tend to do that too. Oh boy, we need to, we need to pay for this now. Well, let's just take out another loan to pay that loan. And, and so we kind of start that process. Okay, good. What else with maybe the family structure, thinking at a personal level. How do people become bankrupt? What does it mean to be bankrupt? What's that? Um, no, not. Uh, I mean, that might be that might be a symptom that you're that you're going down. But there's there's a kind of a state uh, a situation where you're you're bankrupt. You can't afford to make the payment on your debt. Okay, you can't afford to to make your payments. Yeah, you can't afford to to service the debt. And then there's also something called insolvency that's related to that that you might have heard in some other classes. A little bit more of a finance term, but we we talked about it in other macro classes too. Basically, the same thing. You have to have a different name. Uh, well, it's a stock flow issue. So bankruptcy—if you can't make your payment, right? 
So if you're illiquid, what would that mean? Don't have cash. You might have assets, right? So you've got assets, but you don't have cash assets. You don't have liquid assets. So you're illiquid. Now, if you're insolvent, you don't have assets. You don't have assets. You don't have net assets. So you, even if you sold everything you got, and there's not enough to pay off all your liabilities, you're upside down. Your net worth is negative. So. All these things kind of relate together, and the same thing can go on with countries. So how does the idea of bankruptcy for a country work? So bankruptcy for a country. What is, what is going on in their world that they are effectively bankrupt? Um, not so much necessarily your gross domestic product. It's even less than that. How, does the, how do they make their payments? How does the country make their payments? Income from taxes. Income from taxes. So it's more of a tax inflow. If, if, we're, if we're at the government level, how do I pay my bills? I collect tax revenue. And so if I'm not collecting enough tax revenue to pay my bills, then I'm in a bankruptcy situation. In order to make those payments to keep my accounts good, I could borrow, which is what governments are doing, right? So now governments are borrowing, kind of robbing from Peter to pay Paul, kind of similar to, to shuffling the debt around. Somebody's willing to uh, loan them some money, and so they take that and pay that interest payment in hopes that tomorrow I'll collect the tax revenue and make things good. Right? So you can, you can start to do that for a while and maintain things. But countries can become insolvent too if they don't have enough assets, even if they sold things. And, and so now some countries are being forced um, as part of their austerity measures to sell some famous works of art. So this has been in the news uh, lately, like over in Greece, they got some nice stuff, like the government owns some old paintings. You know, you can imagine uh, France selling the Mona Lisa. Well, why don't you just put that sucker up for sale and that'll take care of your debt, right? You can imagine there's a little bit of an outcry from, from the culture, from the people, if they have assets that they're either not willing to sell, and so, but if, but if there comes a point where um, they can't pay their bills, they might be forced into that situation. Isn't, it the same, isn't the same thing happen basically with Detroit? Yes, yeah, yeah. So the, at the city level, um, they had to get rid of some of their art, you're right. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I can't remember what it was, but they had some fairly major pieces of art in, I don't know if it was in art museums or if it was in public buildings or what it was, but um, the, Detroit declared bankruptcy and that's still in process right now but that's what they had that was part of what they had to do was sell their assets now if the value of the Mona Lisa's and the value of the assets are down because the economy's down then again you might be in a situation where you don't have enough assets to pay all your liabilities and so um, uh, in the uh, in the private sector if uh, person does that, the bankruptcy laws allow you to kind of start fresh. The people who you owed the money to uh, are out. That was a risk they took on. And you get to start with a, a clean slate. Well, Iceland did that. So Iceland declared bankruptcy. There was uh, people who owned Iceland bonds that uh, loaned money to Iceland that Iceland said, sorry, we're never paying you back. We are declaring bankruptcy, we're done. And other countries like Greece and Spain have uh, agreed to try to pay back emergency loans, whether that's coming from the IMF, but again, it was kind of the Rob Peter to pay Paul story. Somebody gives them an emergency loan and that kind of saves the day for a little bit. But in order for the uh, International Monetary Fund to give that loan, it came with conditions. So conditionality is another topic in this chapter. Um, and it's also, I don't think it's really even referred to in the chapter, but austerity is, is the other word that they use for that. So I will loan you money if you do this, 
if you run your country this way, if you promise not to print money and run the printing press, if you, you know, follow these laws for uh, uh, maybe labor unions is a big issue, especially over in Greece. So if the pensions are cut in half, if this, if this, if this. And so now you've got an outsider telling you how to run your country and the conditions that need to be in place in order to do it. And um, under the conventional wisdom uh, of, of macroeconomics, which may not be sound in all cases, as, as can be argued by some economists, uh, conventional fiscal policy is that it's OK to run a deficit if you're in a recession. But these austerity measures might say, no, we don't want you to spend more money than you collect in taxes. And so now you're already in a recession, and you're not being able to run a deficit to try to scoop you out. Uh, so you're in, you're in kind of a tight spot. You got to maybe ride it out. Part of it was because you have to remember the party that you had 10 years ago with all that uh, stuff that you bought. But it's kind of hard when the politicians try to remember what did we spend all? The, what did we waste all that money on before? Oh gosh, I remember being drunk, but I don't remember what all we bought. But apparently, we had a fun time, and now it doesn't feel so good, right? That that's kind of the situation that uh, countries have uh, found themselves in in uh, in this time frame. Okay, questions or comments so far. Okay, moral hazard. We've seen this one come up a few different times. So in this context, the incentive to act in a manner that creates personal benefits at the expense of the common good. The banks have an incentive to make riskier investments when they know they will be bailed out. So at the country level, are these countries doing everything within their power to avoid debt and deficits? You know, or could they do a little bit more? Or in the back of their minds, are they saying, "Well, we'll get that loan. Somebody will. Somebody will loan us the money." You know, eventually. And so it keeps getting. It's kind of this slow creeping thing of of a change in behavior, and that's that's the moral hazard feature that economists uh, hone in on. So it not only happens at the um, at the buffet line for us when we when we go to the union to eat lunch, and we might just tend to eat a little bit more than we would uh, otherwise, or we drive a little more recklessly when we have an insurance policy that we know will be covered in, in case there's an event. I don't have to worry about crashing my thirty thousand dollar car because the insurance company will pay for it anyway if something happens. Well, all of that spirals up to this country level the same way. So moral hazard is, is uh, not something specific at, at the micro level. Crony capitalism. Who remembers that one? I don't know if we've talked about it much in this class. Get together with your cronies. Essentially, the people that run the government provide favors to the uh, lobbyists. Money off the and on. Okay, so it might be in in their personal self-interest to uh, steer government contracts to their buddies, <laughs> right? And so maybe if we wine and dine the congressman enough and send them on a trip to. Cancun and, and buy the, you know, fly them out there on a private jet, maybe we can get that subsidy. And maybe we can get that, that, that action coming our way or that favor, favorable um, uh, situation in the, in the tax code. So that is the, the crony capitalism. And, and so some of these uh, financial crises have kind of stemmed from that type of thing going on. All right, so moral hazard. All right, I'm going to cut there for today so we can talk. Oh, about a couple of different things. One thing is your homework for chapters uh, yeah, 10 and
in 12, um, not due till towards the end of April. I think I put the 20th. Okay, so ways out. You guys set your own schedule. Obviously, we've covered the chapter, so you can jump in there and do it tonight if you want. It's open. Jump in there. Um, maybe for some reason you want to wait till later. I don't really care. So, um, but mark it in your calendars because what we're going to spend the next couple weeks on is, is focusing on some on some current event issues. So, um, I'm going to have you guys do some short little. Uh, reviews of some different countries that you're going to present to the class. And I have picked some countries. Israel, India, China, the Ukraine, Venezuela, Taiwan, and South Korea. All countries are in trouble. Each of you, yeah, love that you should be able to find some exciting events. Yes, the and we're a little intentional that way. And I've assigned each of you one of those countries. It's at the top of the at the top of the list. Is this new? Uh, we're gonna do it. Um, I was gonna see if somebody wanted to knock it out, and this is this is a well let me talk about what the project is first, because uh, that, that will bear maybe on, on when the timing is. But next week at the latest, we'll start Monday on it for sure. And I was going to see if there's a volunteer that wants to even knock it out uh, Friday if you were anxious to just get it out of the way. So, um, so you're going to give an oral presentation to the class about some economic current event going on in the country you're assigned as well as a written takeaway list of highlights for each person in class. Uh, since just talking, uh, since just about anything can fall under the condition of economic, uh, this is for this exercise you should be able to relate the material to a specific concept in our textbook from one or more of the chapters we covered in class so if you're kind of questioning like oh well there's something interesting going on with uh, labor or, or something in a country you know some sort of current event and you need to ask yourself is this relevant well if you can find if you can tie it to something in the book um, then then it's fair game so you should be able to just tie it back to, to something we covered in class, or a couple different chapters for that matter, depending on what you dig up. So I gave you a couple websites that I'm just going to show you here. Should give you pretty quick access to uh, some sources. So this global issues is South Korea. That's Korea. North Korea. Oh, that's North I decided Korea. to, I was thinking about doing North Korea, but that one's so backwards. But actually, that's one of the reasons I picked South Korea, because they're neighboring to it. So that, that topic could come up in general. So, um, so since you brought it up, if you guys go to the search engine on this global issues site and just put your country, whatever it is, it will bring up these articles of stuff that's related to South Korea that have been on that are, are you know fairly recent articles. And so you can kind of sift through on, on something that's been in the news fairly recently. I don't think it'll take you too long to kind of sort through something that's re, you know related to, to international because that's why it's there at the country level in the first place. So recently would be like 2014 calendar year? Yeah, I'd even let you go to 2013. Um, is fine, but something fairly recent with the with the country. For, for the late, the you know, the first one you find that's that's relevant would be probably preferred, although if it's a real awesome topic and it's you know late to 2013, that'll be fine. But no, no older than 2013. Yeah. 2014, we've only got three months in, so yeah, roughly a year and whatever three months. Yeah. So I see it's, a, it's an oral presentation for the, for the map location where you want us to bring it. Picture. You can use the, the podium, yeah, yeah. Just to kind of give an idea of where it is as part of the part of your materials, you I mean, can we'll have. You'll be able to use the computer. And put the yeah, okay. yeah. You'll come up and use the computer, so you can bring a little thumb drive, <coughs> um, use whatever is whatever this? resources you want. And is you going on like Google Sites? Or anything? No, I don't want it on Google Sites. But part of the reason I'm doing this exercise is so that you've got another thing for a, a 
later adding on to your Google Sites project, but you've kind of used a different country and, and kind of checked out some current this events. This is one current event or current events that you want to do uh, whatever you whatever you choose, you got about ten to fifteen minutes. So if, if one current event's kind of interesting, but it's kind of a, just a quick little flash pan thing, then you can do a couple things. So you're not limited to one topic, but obviously you need at least one topic. And like the Ukraine's got multi-layer. Who did I give Ukraine to? Was that you, Dylan? I mean, yeah. There's not going to be any shortage of various topics there. It might be harder to to weed through which ones you want to present. Um, the other. Let, let me, uh, and, and there's not really a formal, the written reports do at the same time, but it's just a bullet list. So I'm not asking you to even write a paper. So what I'd like to do is get, get um, you know, some fresh stuff in into the class and we can kind of have some discussion on current events. Um, this was the UN uh, page. So all the nations are in here too. Again, if you search the UN website and I throw in, uh, Ukraine, and it does a similar little <coughs> search. All of these were, and some of them, there might be overlap between the two. You do not need to limit yourself to these two places if you guys want to do a normal Google search, but I thought I'd show you a couple spots where it's specific global issues that'll talk about things that are likely relevant to class. CNN, okay. See, yeah, for this one, it doesn't have to be, you know, fancy journals or anything. Uh, it can be popular news sites. I do want you to cite it, though. Uh, one of the reasons I want you to do that uh, is if somebody misses class or something, they're going to have to go back and read whatever you, um, the stuff you had as part of them, because this will be uh, part of the final exam, potentially, with your takeaways on your whatever current event you bring to the table. So do you have an example that will qualify as an interesting demographic? Um, well, if you're talking about a country that's... Uh, in the uh, mountains, and so they're, uh, what's the population of the country? Is it primarily black, white, Chinese? You know, d that demographic is kind of just general things about the area and, and the people that are there. Average income levels, are they poor, or they, you know, that sort of stuff. That's, that's what demographics are. Just, just to kind of put it in context, because not all of us might understand your country. I, I, some of them are a little more obscure. You know, what's that country like? Just to give us, give us a little feel um, because whatever that current event is, whether it's a uh, financial crisis or a war or, or you know, whatever is going on in your, in your country, you kind of want to put that into context as to what, what type of regime. Uh, is it more of a market-based country? Is it a communist country? You know, that sort of thing. Kind of just to fill in the context of the country. Okay. Um, anything else? Do I have any volunteers to try to just, and about 10 to 15 minutes, I meant to put that on here, so write, write that on your list here. Um, you saw how we did that first intro and five minutes just flew by like, like nothing. Here you can get into a little bit more detail. You can go off, and notice part in the conclusion and the current events, I'm kind of wanting you to tie it to the textbook so that, oh yeah, remember in chapter four we talked about this, and, and so this kind of, so something along those lines. So. On what? Uh, Juan Pablo. Oh. He's from Venezuela, the bachelor. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. All right, and that's why I put economic topics so that we don't get on uh, too many social social themes. So, all right, any other questions on that? All right, we'll call it a day. Oh, did I have any volunteers for Friday?